Nothing else for supper tonight. Nothing but this piece of black bread. Oh, how I wish your father were still alive. Now, who can that be? I'll answer it, Mother. At the door stood a tall, strange man. He wore a white turban of the purest silk. Why, hello. Aladdin, how are you, my boy? I'm all right, thank you. Who are you, please? Oh, who am I? Oh, I forget you've never seen me before. I am your uncle. My uncle? Yes, your uncle, Hamid. I'm a famous magician. Of course, the stranger wasn't really Aladdin's uncle. He was pretending. But why? Soon we'll know exactly why. Meanwhile, he performed feats of magic and showed Aladdin and his mother that he really was a magician. He made clouds appear and start raining. He clapped his hands and made thunder. Now, Aladdin, I want you to come with me on a very important journey. Where, Uncle? To the most secret part of the forest. They came to an underground cave. Now, my boy, deep down inside the cave, you will find a lamp. Bring it to me. Aladdin slipped down into the cave. Deeper and deeper he went. Finally, he came upon a lamp. An old, dirty lamp that looked absolutely worthless. Could this be what he wants? Suddenly, a strange feeling came over Aladdin. He felt that he must not give up the lamp, but keep it for himself. For a long time, Aladdin remained silent, refusing to give up the lamp. I'll seal him in forever. The magician intoned some mysterious words, and a huge rock fell into the entrance of the cave, sealing it off. Then he left, never to return. Poor Aladdin. He stood inside the pitch black cavern holding the lamp and not knowing what to do. In the darkness, he stubbed his toe and fell heavily on the ground. Oh. Then to his amazement, the cave was filled with light that flowed from a huge genie that appeared out of nowhere. You called, master? Who are you? The slave of the lamp. Whenever you rub the lamp, I appear to grant you your every wish. Rub the lamp? Oh, I, I must have rubbed it by accident when I fell. That is true, master. Now command, and I obey. Aladdin's first thought was for his mother. My mother has worked hard all her life, O Genie. I wish her good things to eat and fine clothes and a comfortable home. Your wish is granted, my master. Come and see. In an instant, Aladdin was home again. Mother, I'm back. My son, look, a wonderful thing has happened. And indeed, his mother was now dressed in fine clothes and lived in a fine house. Suddenly, there was a sound from the street. The sound of royal music. Aladdin sprang to the window and saw the Sultan passing by in his carriage. And with him was his beautiful young daughter. For years, Aladdin had secretly been in love with her. But how could he, unknown and the son of a widow, hope to marry the Sultan's daughter? How could he even enter the Sultan's palace without being stopped by the guards? Then Aladdin had an idea. The lamp. Here, let me rub the lamp. What do you wish, my master? Take 
Take me to the palace of the Sultan. Your wish is granted, my master. Who are you? My name is Aladdin. I love you and wish to marry you. But how can that be? I am promised to another, Mephisto, son of the Grand Vizor. He rubbed the magic lamp. What do you wish, master? Form an army of invaders. Have them appear at the gates of Baghdad, but to harm no one. Your wish is granted. The Sultan's daughter saw that Mephisto was a coward, but still she thought she should marry him. Next, Aladdin had the genie change him into a helpless old beggar. Please, Mephisto, I am starving. Help me. Help you? Get out, you lazy old man. And the Sultan's daughter saw that Mephisto was cruel, but still she thought she should marry him. Finally, Aladdin ordered the genie, in disguise, to tell Mephisto that the Sultan and his daughter had quarreled and that she had been disinherited. Worthless woman! What good is she to me without her father's money? When the Sultan's daughter heard that, her eyes were opened and she refused to marry him. <laughs> She fell in love with Aladdin and married him instead. Listen to my story and listen to it well. I'll tell you of a great man who served his country well. His name was Daniel Boone and he wore a coonskin hat. And his clothes were made of buckskin, now what do you think of that? Dan was born in Pennsylvania in 1734. In colony days before the Revolutionary War. He was famous as a hunter while he was still a boy. And the hours he spent in the forest, they were his greatest joy. Did you hear that? That was Daniel Boone with his long rifle out hunting a bear. Listen. <laughs> He got him. Daniel Boone shot that bear. That was when Daniel was only 15 years old. Yes, Daniel Boone was the greatest hunter and explorer this country ever had. Now, sometimes Dan hunted bears. And sometimes wildcats. And other times the timber wolf. Daniel Boone loved to explore, too, and he was one of the first pioneers to see the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Blue Grass region of Kentucky. Oh, Daniel knew the forest, he knew the forest well, the mountains and the rivers and where the animals dwell. He was handy with a rifle and with a hunting knife, and he loved the open spaces, the cleanest kind of life. Of course, there were other dangers in the forest in those days besides wild animals. There were Indians, and one day when Daniel was exploring a cut in the mountains where Kentucky, Virginia, and Tennessee meet, an area known as Cumberland Gap, he knew there were Indians ahead, unfriendly Indians. Quickly, Daniel turned around, and silently he cut back on his own trail, but the Indians were behind him, too. Dan was surrounded. Dan fought like a wildcat. But the odds were just too great. He was captured and taken to the Indians' camp. The Indians knew Daniel's reputation, and they tied him to a tree post to prevent his escape. That night, when the Indians were asleep, Dan found a sharp piece of bark right back of where his hands were tied. Slowly and painfully, he rubbed the leather cord against the bark until at last he was free. Then, as quiet as a cat, he escaped. The Indians followed, but Daniel covered ground so fast that he left their swiftest runners behind. 
He covered 160 miles on foot in four days, and he met his friends, settlers from back east at Cumberland Gap. During the Revolutionary War, Dan was a major in the American Army, and his great knowledge of forestry and wood lore came in handy when he fought the British and the Indians on the British side. But he was friendly to many Indians because... Daniel was a fair man to red men and to white, and he never used his rifle unless he had to fight. He didn't like big cities, he kept on moving west, and he helped to build our country and tame the wilderness. When the Revolutionary War was over, Dan kept heading west until he made his final home in Missouri. There he would sit under a tree during the day, and settlers and Indians came to him with their problems, for he was a man of great justice and simple democracy. His tree became famous as Boone's Judgment Tree. Often Dan sat under it and remembered his old battles and adventures, and he would fondly dream of his hunting days when he hunted the big bear and the savage wildcat and the wild timber wolf. And now you've heard my story, there is no more to tell. The story of Daniel Boone, who served his country well. His clothes were made of buckskin and he wore a coonskin hat. A democratic pioneer, I hope you'll remember that. recognize that music? That's right. It was the trumpet, the king's trumpet. And here's a wonderful story about that music. In a faraway land, there one time lived a shepherd king who owned many flocks and had many shepherds who tended sheep for him. One day, this king wanted to call all of the shepherds together. So he sent a runner for them. When they arrived, the king spoke to them and said, Pay heed, ye shepherds. Henceforth, when I call ye, I will no longer send a runner. For look, I have fashioned for myself an instrument made from the horn of a ram. With it I can make many tones. So hark, shepherds. If you should hear me playing this, Come home at once. This instrument we will call a shofar. Soon, each shepherd made his own shofar, and each made up his own call. They all made a set of calls so they could speak to each other. And while the sheep grazed, one could often hear the call of the shofar echoing from hilltop to hilltop. Later, when the king became mighty, he had an army, and the shofar was used to call men to war. As time went on, men learned to work with metals. Soon, they found that horns could be made of brass and gold and silver. These horns could play many more tones than could the ram horn. So the kings had trumpets made to play their special calls. They also found that if they made a trumpet long, they played low notes like this. And when they made the trumpet short, they played high notes like this. Now, in England, there lived a king named Richard the Lionhearted. And when he made ready to go forth with his army of knights, he would call his band of trumpeters and say, Ho, master of the trumpet, sound off. And the master of the trumpet would reply, I am a lord. Trumpeters, prepare. Sound the tucket. Then, 
As the king and his knights marched into the great cathedral for prayer, the trumpets could be heard playing music like this. Early in the 18th century, a wise musician said, we need many trumpets because each one plays only a few notes. Now, let me see. If I make a trumpet with a piece of metal that moves up and down in a pipe and put a hole in the side of that piece of metal, I can use it to connect the different pipes to my trumpet. When I push it down, air will go through a long pipe and make a low sound. And when I let go, the air will go through a short pipe and make a high sound. Now, he had a trumpet with a valve that played many tones. Later, trumpet makers built a trumpet and put three valves in it. Musicians found that they could play all of the notes in the scale. One day, a musician brought his trumpet to the king and said, Sire, I present to you a new invention, a three-valve trumpet. The king looked at the instrument curiously and said to the musician, Play that instrument, musician, and let me hear what it can do. So the musician raised the trumpet to his lips and played a tune like this. very pleased, and the musician was greatly rewarded. Once upon a time, high in the highest tower of the faraway city of Glickenglocken, there was a wonderful clock. The numbers on its face were inlaid with precious jewels, and its hands were carved of purest ivory. And to mark every hour, one silver cock crowed. Two brass trumpeters came out and played. And a little golden angel sang. Dawn is here, time won't wait. The sun is rising in the heaven. Start the day, be not late. The hour is seven, it is seven. The people of Glickenglocken were very proud of their wonderful clock. So proud were they that no one in the city had a clock or watch of his own. Across the river from Glickenglocken stood the ugly city of Dumburg. Now the wicked king of Dumburg had always wanted to conquer Glickenglocken, but he was afraid to attack. Suddenly the king cried, Hmm, I have it. I'll stop their big clock, and without watches or clocks of their own, they won't be able to tell the time. Everything will be thrown into confusion, then I will strike. So the wicked king of Dumburg sent his boldest henchman into Glickenglocken to stop the clock. Slyly, the henchman crept close to the tower, just as the clock was about to strike. Hands of the wonderful clock pointed to three as he tiptoed up the steps. Quietly, he took a big hammer from under his cloak. Listen, all, hear the shout. 
of children running fast and free. School is out. School is out. The hour is three. The hour is... <laughs> the clock was stopped. Yes, the big clock was stopped. Its hands pointed to three and moved no more. Then, just as the wicked king of Dumburg had planned, all over the city of Glickenglocken there was terrible confusion. What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? Should we work? Should we work? Or should we stop? Or should we stop? Should we open up the stars and close up every shop? Every shop. Wicked King brought his army to a high ridge just across the river, and there behind the hill they waited while things in Glickenglocken grew more and more confused. Is it late? Is it early? Goodness, what a hurly burly. Is it early? Is it late? What's the hour? What's the date? Maybe it is time for bed. Get up quick and work instead. What has happened to our town? Everything is upside down. The Wicked King cried, Now is the time! Over the bridge and Glickenglocken will be ours! Swiftly his soldiers advanced toward Glickenglocken, and just as they reached the middle of the bridge, everyone stopped. They looked up. Here. Is magical. Yes, Captain, and the magic has saved our city. To the bridge, man! The soldiers of Glickenglocken rushed to the bridge and drove the wicked king and his army back into Dumburg. And to this day, if you visit the faraway city of Glickenglocken, high in the highest tower, you will see their wonderful clock. Its hands still point to three, but every hour, by some strange magic, the one silver cock crows. Two brass trumpeters come out. And the little golden angel sings. Seconds fly, minutes flow, and hours into days and years swirl. Time speeds by, all should know that time is precious, use your time well.
And now for the big fight. Pitting El Toro Diablo, weight 2,452 pounds, 6 feet 8 inches tall, if you do not count his horns, which are 3 feet long, and the brave matador Juan Pablo Garcia Miguel, weighing 53 pounds, 3 feet 2 inches tall, if you do not count the act, which is 4 inches high. The fight will commence after the march of the Toreador. Senores y senores, it is time to start the big fight. Here comes El Toro Diablo. And now, here comes Juan Pablo, carrying only a red cloak and his wooden sword. Poor Pablo, poor Juan Pablo, as for fighting he must be good. For there he is alone with the great big bull, and his sword is made of wood. And now, El Toro rushes Juan Pablo. Ah, what form, what grace. Juan Pablo steps aside as El Toro rushes by. Uh-oh. Here he comes again. Caramba! Juan Pablo stood his ground, and the bull barely missed him. What bravery! What skill! And here comes the bull again. El Toro seems to be tiring. Here he comes. And boys and girls, Juan Pablo has ignored his sword and thrown the bull to the ground with his bare hands. And El Toro Diablo, the biggest bull ever to enter the bull ring, is just lying there. He is afraid to get up. And now, Juan Pablo pulls him by his orange and rides the bull around the ring. Hola! Strike up the van! In Spain, the town of Caramba, Seville, lived the bravest matador of them all. His name was Juan Pablo. Long time after God had created the world and made man and all the animals and birds, he noticed that people were no longer kind to each other and that they didn't obey God anymore. So he was angry. But God did see one man in the world who was kind and good and who obeyed the Lord's word. This man was Noah. So God appeared to Noah and he let him hear his voice. And the Lord said, Behold, I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. I will bring a flood the earth to destroy all flesh, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But God told Noah to build an ark and to take two of every animal in it with him to keep alive during the storm. And when Noah had heard God's voice, he was grateful, and he set to work right away to build the ark. This was a great boat with many, many rooms in it. When Noah finally finished it, he went out into the fields and woods, for he had to talk to all kinds of animals and birds. He talked to the lion, and the wild horses. He talked to the pigs in the barnyard, and the elephants in the jungle, and the cute little kittens in his own house. Noah talked to all the animals on the face of the earth, even to the doves, cooing in their nests. And Noah 
picked a mother and a father of each kind of animal and bird, and he told them to come to the ark. Well, when they were all gathered there, you can imagine what kind of a noisy crowd poor Noah had on his hands. What with lions roaring and pigs squealing and monkeys chattering and hyenas laughing, well, it must have been noisier than a crowd of children on the annual Sunday school excursion. But Noah was wise and gentle, and he understood about animals, so he got them lined up in a long row, two by two, and then he started them up and into the ark through the big door in the side. Uh, the bees were the last to go in. Because bees have a stinger in their tails, and no animal wanted to get in line behind them. Noah stored food in the boat, and then saw that his wife and his sons and their wives were safely inside. Then he shut the big door behind him, and he bolted it so that no one could get... Then, there was a flash of lightning, and the thunder roared as it never had before. Big black clouds hid the sun so that it was almost as dark as night. And out of those clouds came the greatest rain the world has ever known. It lasted for 40 days and 40 nights, as God had promised Noah. All the land was covered with water, and not a house or a living thing remained anywhere. But Noah's ark floated on the surface of the waters, and he and his family, and the animals who were in the ark with them, were saved. On the 40th day, the rain stopped and the sun came out. The waters that had covered the earth began to flow back into the oceans and the rivers, and the ark came to rest on the peak of a mountain. But Noah wasn't quite sure that there was enough dry land for all his animals to live on. So he took one of the doves and let it fly out of the window. In a little while, it came back, and in its beak, the dove carried the branch of an olive tree. Noah knew that this must be a sign from God that he had restored quiet and peace to the world. So, he opened the door of the ark, and he and his family and all the animals came out on the dry land, and they praised God and thanked him. Then the Lord appeared again to Noah. He promised him that he would never again send a flood to destroy the earth. And he sealed that promise with a beautiful symbol, which he set in the sky for all of us to see. That symbol, the token of God's everlasting faith in man, is the rainbow. Panchito, Panchito, if you will look at the first picture in your teletalkie, you will see a little burro. His name is Panchito. He's the little fellow with the big ears. One little chicken, she clocked. The little goose, he hung. And the little pig, he squealed. But when Panchito tried to bray, out came nothing. He tried and he tried, but no hee-haw. And right away, the little animals made up a song about him. Panchito! He is a good little burro, but he cannot bray. and geeses, their nephews and nieces all say. What a shame, such a shame. Too bad for the parents of Lu Panchito. Panchito has ruined their name. Panchito. Ay, poor Panchito. His heart was so heavy like a stone. 
He was so ashamed, he ran away and climbed to the top of the highest mountain. And when he got there, what do you think he saw? A little eagle in his nest. The little eagle was crying. So Panchito, he said... Hey, little eagle, why do you cry? And the little eagle said... I cannot fly. And when an eagle cannot fly, there is much to cry about. And when Panchito heard this, he said... Ay, you poor little eagle. You are almost so bad off like me. I am a little burrow, and I cannot pray. I, you poor little burrow. Do you mind if I cry with you? No? No, little burrow. Let us cry together. Thank you. <laughs> and after they could not cry no more, each felt so sorry for himself and for one another, they decided to jump off the mountain and end it all. <laughs> Well, Panchito and the little eagle did jump off the top of the mountain. But as they were falling down and down, suddenly the little eagle called out. Look, look, my wings, they're flying. Flap your ears, little burrow, and fly like me. I can't. I can't. And the ground kept getting bigger and bigger and closer and closer and more bigger. But just before the ground got big enough to hit Panchito, the little eagle grabbed him by the tail. <laughs> And Panchito made a one-point landing right on the tip of his nose. And the little eagle, he said... Little burro, you know what? You brayed. No, no, I did not bray. Oh, but you did. You only think you cannot bray, like I thought I could not fly. So if you think you can bray, you can bray. So what you think? Panchito did not know what to think. But he thought he ought to think, and maybe think some more. In the meantime, at the village, a big fiesta was commencing to begin. The little chicken was practicing her clock. The little goose was practicing his honk. The little pig was warming up his squealer. The band was playing pretty music, and everybody was happy. That is... Everybody but the papa and mama of little Panchito. And they were very sad. Oh, my poor Panchito. If we only had him back, we would not care if he never prayed nothing. <laughs> Listen, papa. What is it? And when the papa burro looked to see, there was little Panchito standing beside the little chicken, the little goose, and the little pig. And when the band did play, you never did hear such music. For Panchito, he joined in and brayed. Hee-haw, hee-haw. Now, little Panchito makes the biggest and most beautiful hee-haw in all Mexico. <laughs> Which goes to prove, if you think you cannot, you cannot. But if you think you can, you can. I think. <laughs> of the South lives a quiet, friendly little animal with a sharp nose and a long tail called the possum. Not equipped by nature to be a fighter, the possum has another way to protect himself. When trapped by the hunter's dogs, he plays dead, and the dogs leave him alone. 
Little Peppy Possum, the hero of this story, sings about it. When the dogs are near, a possum plays dead, and he lies sprawled out like he fell on his head. He doesn't move a muscle, he's as still as can be. He's playing possum just to fool him, you see. When the dogs go home, possum blinks his eye. Then he flips his tail, bids the dogs goodbye. But the dogs don't hear, cause they're far away. Old possum don't care, he likes it that way. That is, all possums but me. I'm a little possum who won't play possum. I don't like to stay too long in one place. I'm a little possum who won't play possum. And I like to lead the dogs on their hairy chase. Little Peppy Possum's father worried about his son. And one day, he took him aside for a little talk. Uh, Peppy? Yes, Pappy? Peppy? How come you don't play dead when the dogs are chasing you? I just don't scare easy, I reckon. Who's scared of old hound dog, Pappy? Oh, I can tell you that, Pappy. Who, Pappy? Your Pappy, Pappy. That's who. But Pappy just laughed and ran off into the deepest part of the forest, looking for danger and excitement for adventure. I guess my Pappy means well. Well, he doesn't have to worry about me. I'm smarter than old hound dog. But suddenly, without warning, out from behind a bush jumped Major, one of the biggest, most ferocious hound dogs in the forest. <coughs> well, well, who have we here? Little Peppy Possum, I do declare. Ha, 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 howdy, Major. Well, I enjoyed our little talk, but I gotta go now. Bye. Hold on there, Peppy. Gotcha. <laughs> you leave go my tail, Major. You hear me? I don't like it. And if I don't let go? Well, reckon I'll just have to learn to like it. I'm a taking you home to my master. He just loves possum stew. Oh, Pappy, Pappy. Why didn't I listen to you? You were right, and I was wrong. Poor little Peppy Possum. He was being dragged away, and there seemed to be nothing he could do about it. Old Major, the hound dog, was dragging poor little Peppy Possum to his master's house. Peppy, not wishing to become the principal ingredient of a possum stew, decided to do something about it. He relaxed all his muscles, which made him heavy and hard to drag. Here now, how come you're so heavy all of a sudden? Don't you go to sleep now. I know your possum tricks. No, Major, I'm not asleep, but I am sleepy. Oh, oh. And before long, I'll be sound asleep. And then I'll be so heavy, you'll never be able to drag me. Never, huh? Never, unless you listen to what I got to say. I got a plan. Now, about a half mile from here is a little old brook full of nice, cold water. Nice, cold water, huh? That's right. You go and get some, then bring it here and throw it on me. That'll make me wide awake, and then you can drag me home. How do I know you won't run away? You don't. Then I'm not going. Well, in that case, I better get on with my... Oh, help! Sleeping. Wake up, Peppy. You wake up now, you hear? If you go to sleep, you'll be too heavy to drag home. I'll do what you want. I'll go get the nice cold water. As soon as Major left, Peppy, who wasn't sleepy at all, of course, climbed up to the top of a live oak tree. Here he waited until Major returned. Hey, hey, you, Peppy Possum, you come right down out of that tree. I got you some nice cold water. I sure am sorry I caused you all this trouble, Major, but I don't need it anymore. <laughs> oh, Peppy, you make me tired. Tired, eh? Then throw the cold water on yourself. I feel fine. This little possum was 
was sure scared today, and I thank my stars that I got away. Dogs taste opossum, Mr. Nature, too, so a possum's got to do what he's got to do. Oh, I've learned that dogs are something to fear. When they're around, I'd better stay clear, or else I'll play dead, as my pappy advised. Playing possum's not bad, I just realized. faraway country named Greece, a soldier, Artemis, and his little boy, Plino. One day, Artemis took Plino on a hunting trip. When nightfall came, they were far from home. It was warm. Plino and his father found a haystack, and there they went to sleep. Later, Plino awoke. It was black and cold. He reached out to touch his father, but Artemis was gone. Plino heard something moving in the dark. Then he recognized the steps. It was Artemis. Artemis had found some wood. He started a big fire. Lad, he said to Plino, we've been caught by winter. Plino moved close to the fire. He thought for a moment. Then he asked, why, father, is it not always summer? Well, Artemis said, I'm not sure I know exactly. But there's an old story. Get in closer to the fire and I'll tell you. There was a time when all the days were summer days and the grass was green, the flowers grew, and the birds sang all through the year. And in this happy time, there was a young girl named Prosperine. She was beautiful, gentle, unafraid. And she was so kind that even wild animals were tamed before her. One day, Prosperine wandered far from her home into a strange valley. She came to a very old tree. Around its gnarled trunk grew a vine bearing flowers of deep, flashing colors. Prosperine picked some. They were hard to carry, so she took off her cloak and dropped the flowers in it. She was so busy with what she was doing, she did not hear the soft sounds of a huge man who moved quickly, quietly behind her. Then for a second, it seemed to Prosperine that the valley was more quiet than silence itself. She turned. There was a man, tall and broad as a door. His hair was dark. His skin burned hard and brown by the sun. His eyes were black as night. He was Stygis, the soldier they called the Dark Prince. Once he looked at her, Stygis knew that Prosperine must become his princess. Throwing his tunic over her, the huge Stygis slung her on his shoulder like a sack and ran through the valley to his hidden castle in the caves. So quickly did the dark warrior move that Prosperine had not time to cry out, but only to hold tightly to the strange flowers in her hand. When night came and Prosperine had not returned home, her mother Ceres became worried. She threw on her cloak, took a lantern, and went out in search of her daughter. Morning came. Ceres found herself in a strange valley near a very old tree. There on the ground was Prosperine's cloak with beautiful flowers laid carefully upon it. But Prosperine was gone. Ceres wept for her lost daughter, and as her tears fell to the ground, she cried, May the earth be cursed and cold. May no flower, leaf, or blade of grass be green again until Prosperine returns to me. The sun was low in the sky, 
the land grew cold and no flower bloomed. Ceres never gave up searching for her daughter. One day, she stopped before a brook that came from under the big caves nearby. Looking down into the stream, Ceres saw flowers of deep flashing colors, like those from the strange valley. Ceres whispered, if Prosperine be returned to me, then shall the earth be green again. Finding an entrance to the caves, Ceres quietly crept along the cavern walls. Far in the distance below, she could see the dim lights of the castle in the caves. Her foot touched a loose stone. Before she knew it, Stygis warriors were at the bottom of the cliff, climbing up after her. Ceres called, bring Stygis to the bottom of the cliff, for I, Ceres, mother of Prosperine, would speak with him. Stygis came quickly, bringing Prosperine. Ceres called, Stygis, free Prosperine, or I will hurl myself off this cliff and Prosperine shall die after me. The black eyes of the Dark Prince glowered. He did not know what to do. Finally, he said in his rumbling voice, half the year Prosperine may be with you, Ceres, but half the year she must be with me. Ceres looked down and saw the pale, beautiful face of her daughter, Prosperine. Ceres called after Stygis. All right, Stygis, half the year with me, half the year with you. And so it was. When Prosperine was with Ceres, the spring came and the world was green. And when Prosperine went to the castle in the caves, the barren winter visited the world. That, Plino, is the story of the seasons. But Plino didn't hear, for he was fast asleep beside the roaring fire. begins in the ancient country of Persia in the city of Baghdad. One day a porter carrying a heavy load stopped to rest near a beautiful home. He looked at the splendid house and said, how is it this man has so much and I have so little? Why is he so fortunate and I so unlucky? The porter did not realize someone was at the window above him. Bring me that man. Two servants seized the frightened porter. But I didn't mean any harm. Please, where do you take me? To the greatest sailor of all time, Sinbad. He would speak with you. So the poor porter was brought before the owner of this fine house, Sinbad the sailor. Spare me, O oh master. <laughs> do not be afraid, my friend. I heard your remarks as you rested, and I would like to tell you a story. A tale you will never forget. Please be my guest and feast with me while I tell you of my adventures. As a young boy, I was very poor, but I was determined to search for my fortune. I decided on a sailor's life and signed on as a deckhand on the Golden Fleece. She was the most beautiful and fastest ship that ever outraced a pirate craft. I sailed for many years, learning the business of shipping and trading, waiting for the day when I would own my own boat. One day, we were caught in a typhoon and blown far off our course. A giant wave washed me into companions overboard. We clung to a log for a while, but soon we were separated in the storm. Then, night fell over the violent sea. I swam until I found myself on a strange beach. Confused and frightened, I wandered into the jungle and became lost. Finally, I dropped from exhaustion. When I awoke in the morning, I was next to a great white wall but then I discovered it was a monstrous egg. Only one bird could lay an egg such as this, the rock. I remembered an ancient story about an island of fortune where the rock bird lived. Perhaps, I thought, this was it. A great flapping of wings startled me. The rock. I hid under the egg, wondering what to do when I had a desperate plan. I tied myself to the rock's leg so that when he flew high above the trees, I could get my directions. As we went higher and higher, I could see a river leading out to the ocean. Finally, the great bird landed in a cave high on a mountain. A strange light came from within. Untying myself from the bird, I sneaked into the cave and could hardly believe my eyes, the island of fortune. 
For there was a treasure in jewels beyond any dreams. I filled my pockets and clothes with as many jewels as I could carry. When the rock had gone, I sneaked out of the cave and down the mountain. I constructed a log raft and let the river carry me towards the sea. Suddenly, I was no longer moving. The raft had stopped. Then I saw why. A monster 20 feet tall had grabbed the raft and was lifting me up in the air. He had one huge eye, large ears, and an ugly mouth. The hideous creature paralyzed me with fear, for I expected to be killed at any moment. The beast took me to his nearby cave and brought me into a cage, and I saw what my fate was to be. There, tied to stakes, were my two shipmates. The monster was going to cook and eat them. I couldn't see any way of escape. My only hope was to distract the giant somehow. Then I thought of the jewels. While the beast gathered wood for our barbecue, I fashioned a string of dazzling gems. When he returned, I dangled them to attract his attention. The flashing almost hypnotized the monster. He opened the cage door and grabbed the tantalizing jewels while I slipped out. Quickly, I freed my friends and we ran for the river in my raft. The eye of the creature was only interested in the sparkling toy which he had now placed about his neck. But we didn't know how long that would be. Just as we reached the ocean, we heard the roaring of the monster as it came crashing through the jungle, looking for his runaway dinner. He saw us and started wading out faster than we could push away. The jewels sparkled as he moved. Just as he was about to grab the raft, a great shriek stopped him as he looked up. The rock had missed the jewels and had seen them sparkling on the giant. The battle was on. While the two monsters fought, we frantically pushed far out to sea and drifted away with the current. The next day, we were picked up by the Golden Fleece. I had enough jewels to make the entire crew wealthy. I was able to buy my own sailing ship and prospered as a merchant and trader before I settled here in this home. And so, friend, you see, I earn my fortune in a great adventure. For listening to an old man's story, I present you with a gift. The wealth this jewel will bring you will remind you of the famous Sinbad the Sailor.